One. Okay. Uh, can somebody kill those lights back there? It'll be me. Switch to the extreme right and to the extreme left. Oh, wait. More extreme than that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. You're a useful mammal. <clears throat> All right, so, um, people have been wondering what dinosaurs looked like when they were alive pretty much since the moment they were discovered. And uh, although we'll never know for sure with 100% accuracy, there's still a lot that can be done. Um, you look at the dinosaur's skeleton, you look at the size and shapes of the bones, and then you use the science of comparative anatomy to work out the sizes and shapes of the muscles. And when you get all the muscles put into place, that gives you the basic contours of the dinosaur's body. Now, I could go on about that for hours, and I have, but that's not what we're talking about tonight. Tonight, we're talking about what happens after this step right here. Uh, what uh, it does the dinosaur look like after you've covered it with skin? Where's my first note card? So, uh, here is a picture. This is actually one of the very first images of dinosaurs that I ever encountered as a, a child growing up in the late 60s and early 70s. This is a part of the uh, Age of Reptiles mural painted by Rudolf Salinger in 1947 for the Yale Peabody Museum. So this is the extreme uh, left-hand side of the mural showing Cretaceous dinosaurs, including Wyoming's very own uh, Triceratops and Tyrannosaurus rex and uh, an Ankylosaurus uh, down there in the corner. And then there's a, uh, one of the duckbill dinosaurs, a Hadrosaur. And uh, that was in the um, Time Life book series, The World We Live In. And that's where I first encountered this. I still haven't been to Yale. Um, and then here's a, another section of that mural from the center portion showing the Jurassic period, uh, including uh, Brontosaurus and uh, Stegosaurus, two more dinosaurs, which have been found here in Wyoming. Now, this uh, pretty well sums up the image of dinosaurs that existed in the mind of the general public uh, back when I was a kid. They were pea-brained, sluggish, cold-blooded uh, mush eaters that basically loafed around in the swamps, gumming soft water plants to death. Uh, they had a metabolism somewhere between the level of a tortoise and a cabbage. And you might have noticed this in the other picture. Um, they come in any color you like, as long as it's either brown or gray. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure exactly why that is. It might be because people at the time considered uh, dinosaurs to be little more than overgrown Komodo dragon lizards, and Komodo dragons are gray, um, and uh, so are alligators and crocodiles. Um, or it might be because the artists were trying to emphasize that we didn't know what color they were, and so giving them these neutral tones were safe colors. Uh, they knew that they were probably wrong, but at least they weren't spectacularly wrong. Now, unbeknownst um, to me when I was a child, uh, there was a dinosaur revolution going on among the professional paleontologists. Uh, and uh, they were starting to look at the way uh, that dinosaurs might have lived in a very different, uh, different sort of way, from a very different sort of view. And uh, some of those, by the uh, late 70s and the 80s, those ideas were starting to percolate into the public perception, and it was starting to affect uh, dinosaur art. Um, among other things, artists realized that they didn't always have to play paint their dinosaurs gunmetal gray from stem to stern. They looked at uh, the world of animals today and saw lots of um, intricate and interesting color patterns and started to adopt some of those. But what color do you choose when you're illustrating a prehistoric animal? Well, there's a couple of approaches you can take. One is to look at the um, living relatives of that animal. This is a subhyracodon uh, that I drew. Subhyracodon is from the White River Formation <coughs> southeast of Douglas. And uh, I drew a black and then my fiance's closest living relatives are modern Asian rhinos <coughs> and sensation rhinos or gray. Uh, we went with a gray color scheme. So that's one thing you can do. Dinosaurs, of course, are reptiles, so uh, you can look to modern reptiles for inspiration as to uh, color patterns. This is a Spinosaurus that I drew way back in 1993. The, the fin on its back reminded me 
me of the sail on the back of a basilisk lizard. So I borrowed a pattern of uh, intersecting stripes from um, the modern brown basilisk of South America to uh, decorate the Spinosaurus here. I think it looks pretty convincing. Now, uh, there's risks, though, with this particular approach. You can go too far. Here is an illustration from the little golden book of dinosaurs, which people from my generation might remember from their childhood. And here's a Trinosaurus rex attacking a Melasmosaur. Um, does this <coughs> color pattern look familiar to you? If you are from one of the southern states, it might, because it's really similar to the color pattern of a modern collar lizard. Now, if your color pattern is taken from a modern uh, creature and you follow it too closely, that can be distracting to the viewer. Um, at best, at worst, it can actually be kind of absurd. People might be wondering why um, a color pattern identical to that of this 120 gram lizard is now wrapped around a six and a half ton tyrannosaur. <laughs> so you want to uh, use that approach sparingly, or at least choose obscure reptiles that people are less likely to recognize. Now, another thing to come out of the dinosaur renaissance was the realization that the behavior of dinosaurs was probably more complex than had been assumed back in 1947. They weren't just overgrown lizards. They were probably living lifestyles analogous to those that we see in animals of today. For example, Deinonychus um, is thought to have been an ambush predator, something like a modern tiger. So like a tiger, it could very well have had a pattern of stripes to help camouflage it and keep it hidden from uh, its prey until it was time to uh, pounce. Uh, incidentally, this uh, drawing was done for a, a game called uh, Dinosaur Hunters back in 1993. Now, what's this? Bearded lizard. You're close. What'd you say? Modern also close. Good tail iguana. There we go. It's an iguana. It's an iguana. Yeah. And that's I was hoping everybody would say iguana at once. Um, but it is a very distinctive and very recognizable lizard. That's my point. Um, it has uh, a characteristic uh, fringe of long uh, dorsal spines on its neck and on the back of its head and its back. Uh, there's a large scale on the jaw underneath the corner of the mouth. And then there's a, a big fleshy dewlap underneath its chin. So there's no mistaking an iguana uh, when, you, when you see one. However, what are people going to do 10 million years from now when uh, iguanas are known only in fossil forms and we're digging their bones and skulls up from under the ground? Here is an iguana skull. Now, there's absolutely no evidence of the dewlap or the spines or that big scale uh, on it at all. And 10 million years from now, when artists try and reconstruct what the iguana looked like on the basis of its fossil bones and skulls, they're going to get it dead wrong. <laughs> There's no way you get the critter in the last slide from looking at this skull. Now this has given paleoartists the heebie-jeebies ever since the time of Benjamin Waterhouse and Hawkins. How wrong are we getting it? We don't have uh, any clue uh, as to how to reconstruct the texture of the living dinosaur, or at least we didn't until 1908. Now, in 1908, a fellow named Charles Sternberg and his sons, George Levi and Charles Jr., were digging up dinosaur bones um, near the town of Lusk, right here in Wyoming. Um, uh, and the uh, supplies were running really low, and uh, Charles uh, Sr. and Charles Jr. had to go into town in order to uh, get some more food and stuff. And uh, so George and Levi continued digging on their own, and they found the skeleton of a duckbill dinosaur. And uh, they were pretty excited about that, and they started chipping it out, getting the rock out from on top of it. Uh, George removed a uh, large slab of rock from its chest, pried it off and removed it, expecting to see bone underneath. But what he saw was this. The, uh, now, he kind of had to blink a couple of times and convince himself that he really was seeing what he thought he was seeing. Uh, he, he hadn't eaten all day, so he thought maybe I'm just hallucinating because of hunger, maybe I had too much coffee uh, this morning, but eventually he realized that he was looking at dinosaur skin. Um, the skin of the dinosaur had made an impression in the mud before it died, and then later when the skin rotted away, the uh, sediment inside of the carcass pressed itself into that natural mold and made a natural cast. 
So uh, this was uh, the texture, identical to the texture of a living dinosaur. So that was uh, very exciting indeed. And they uh, continued to dig the rest of the thing out, and it turned out that uh, quite a bit of the fossil was covered with skin impressions. The skin was missing on the head and the neck, but on the uh, forearms and the sides and the belly and large portions of the back, uh, there was lots and lots of that skin in place. So they got a really good idea of what the texture of the dinosaur was. When Charles returned to the dig and saw what his son had found, he said, uh, George, this is a finer fossil than any I've found in my entire career. The only thing that would have made me any happier is if I'd found it myself. <laughs> so that was a uh, good, good news coming from uh, his dad. Uh, I had a friend, by the way, who was studying hadrosaurs several years ago. The American Museum of Natural History, which is where this is now, um, let him actually get inside the display and get really close to it uh, in order to take some measurements. And he said, this looks so much like a desiccated carcass that you might find in a stream bed or something, that as he leaned close to it, he half expected to be able to smell it. Uh, here's that same specimen seen um, from above. Uh, but it's lying on its back, so we're looking at it from below. So here you can see uh, large areas of skin on the underside and in the chest cavity here. And there's the cartilaginous ribs. Those almost never fall, uh, preserve, but they are preserved in this specimen. Now, here's a really close-up look at a little piece of that skin. And something that's kind of interesting here is that not all of these scales are the same size. The small ones you see in this picture are about the size uh, of an adult pinky's fingernail, and then the larger ones are about the size of a, a nickel. And you'll notice that they're arranged in a sort of rosette pattern. Um, like there's a rosette there, and there's one there, and there's another one there. Well, um, I read a book that uh, many years ago that suggested that maybe if those um, larger scales were a different color than the smaller scales, that might indicate a spotted pattern. And I said, wow. There's no guarantee that the different sizes of scales were different colors, but it's the only lead we had, so I decided to run with it. So when I was doing the illustrations for Dinosaur Hunters, I, I uh, put leopard spots on uh, my hadrosaur. There's some other things that we've learned about hadrosaur um, appearance in life from those mummies. And by the way, that wasn't the last mummy they found. Uh, since then, several different uh, Dinosaurs have been found with uh, the skin preserved, so um, we know more about their appearance than the appearance of almost any other dinosaur. More on that later. But uh, yeah, the mummies also show us that they've got vertical folds of skin in the shoulder region, and also a ribbon, a thin ribbon of skin running right down the middle of the back. And uh, in Edmontosaurus, at least, it's notched into a series of uh, dorsal uh, rectangles. So that all would have um, given a very distinctive look to the animal in life. And, uh, once again, none of that shows up on the bony skeleton. We never would have known that um, if it hadn't been for the Sternbergs and their fantastic luck. Uh, there's a group of dinosaurs related to hadrosaurs called the Camptosaurids. And when I drew this Camptosaurus, I decided to go ahead and borrow uh, hadrosaur skin to put all over it, including the rosettes. Not unreasonable. These are very closely related to the sorts of dinosaurs that are ancestral to the hadrosaurs. And I borrowed it again for a dinosaur that's not so closely related to the hadrosaurs, although it is still a um, ornithischian. This is my first Taurosaurus drawing with uh, proper uh, hadrosaur skin on it. Now, um, this is based on a specimen that's in the Milwaukee Public Museum, and you'll notice that the uh, horns, the brow horns, are pointing away from each other. Well, um, in 2013, Tate Museum crew dug up our own Taurosaurus, it's in the museum right now, and her horns, she's named Nicole, her horns are pointing forward, parallel to each other. So what's wrong with this one? Well, I had a closer look at the uh, original photo that I was referencing to do this picture. It turns out that except for the tip of this horn, the rest of this through here is just plaster. Plaster and guesswork. And it turns out they guess wrong. So I said, all right, I'm going to draw a new Taurosaurus based on the Nicole specimen. And I'll take the opportunity not only to correct the uh, position of the horns, but also to incorporate some new data 
provided by the Black Hills Institute of South Dakota. They found a triceratops, they named it Kelsey, and Kelsey was found associated with skin impressions. So that gave us a look at uh, um, ceratopsian skin that had never been seen before. Uh, basically, it's a lot like hadrosaur skin, except that the individual scales are a bit larger. But uh, on the underbelly, and I'm assuming also on the underside of the throat, there's bands of rhomboidal or trapezoidal scales. You can see that there. It would have made the underside very similar to the texture of the underside of an alligator or a crocodile. Didn't see that coming. And also, scattered on uh, the flanks and back, uh, in and among the medium-sized scales were uh, some really large scales, about the size of a beer coaster, either round or octagonal in shape. In the middle of each one, a bulge, and in the middle of the bulge, a little divot. They look just about exactly like a tiny volcano, a little model volcano. So these are scattered all over the animal's flanks and uh, might have given it, too, uh, a spotted appearance. Certainly would have given it a very interesting texture, a very <coughs> interesting topology. Now, some artists don't think that that's wild enough, and they have drawn ceratopsians with a quill, like a porcupine quill, sticking right out of the center of each one of those big scales. Um, I didn't have the nerve to do that myself, but if you ever see a triceratops that looks kind of like a porcupine from the neck down, that's why it's based on the Kelsey <laughs> specimen. You can blame it on Kelsey. All right. Now, uh, the problem, of course, the reason why skin impressions are so rare is because skin and scales and uh, spines are made out of keratin, and keratin rots away quickly and easily after an animal dies. But uh, other animals <coughs> have skin texture um, made out of uh, uh, scutes or scales that have bone inside of them. And uh, one of the best examples in the world today is a crocodile or an alligator. They've got a very distinctive texture of uh, scales on the back, and inside of each one of those keratin scales is a core made out of bone. So uh, 10 million years from now, when artists are reconstructing uh, ancient extinct alligators and crocodiles, they are probably going to nail it, because uh, those uh, bony cores in those scutes preserve well. Sometimes they're even found in articulation, and uh, you can uh, reconstruct the appearance of the back of a crocodile or an alligator with a high degree of fidelity. Now this is one of the ankylosaurs, the armor-plated dinosaurs, and um, <laughs> you want to reconstruct the texture of a dinosaur with uh, confidence and accuracy. This can be your favorite group of dinosaurs because they've got bony armor underneath the keratin. So here's a skeleton. This is the, uh, at the American Museum of Natural History in New York of uh, Edmontonia, the genus Edmontonia. And here's that carapace, the upper shell, from the top. So uh, that is what that looks like. And so referencing that, you could conceivably draw a, um, uh, an Edmontonia that looks exactly like a living animal at least from top view. And in 1997, I did. And here that is. Um, so on its back, it has a mosaic of many, many small bony plates all packed together to make a flexible but still quite a strong armor covering. Interspersed among those are larger plates that are oval with a keel and a spine uh, on the uh, surface. And then uh, just behind its head, on its neck and shoulders, are three rows of much larger plates, either oval or subrectangular in shape, each one with a long uh, ridge running right down the middle. So that is uh, very close to the appearance of the live uh, Edmontonia. Another um, ankylosaur uh, is Saropelta, also known from an intact carapace. This is at once again, the American Museum of Natural History in New York. If you're interested in dinosaur skin, that museum is kind of like mecca, because they've probably got more, uh, more dinosaurs than any other that show uh, the, the skin texture. So I've not drawn a Saropelta myself, but Safari LTD made a, a model, a plastic model of a Saropelta, and the artist, I don't know who the artist was, but he did a lot of good research. Look at this thing. 
So there's the photograph of the actual carapace, and here's the, the, the model. I'm not going to call it a toy, it's too good. Uh, and look at that, the texture is identical to the texture that you see on the specimen there. So uh, really a, a really good job, really well-researched uh, sculpt right there. Let's see. Oh, yeah. So here is a skull of a Cetacosaurus. So Cetacosaurus is this dinosaur. The name means parrot lizard because of its somewhat parrot-like beak. And uh, this is the skull of a Cetacosaurus that was found by Roy Chapman Andrews in the 1920s and then sent back to New York and uh, um, described by uh, Henry Fairfield Osborne. Now, I cannot bring up Roy Chapman Andrews without sharing my two favorite Roy Chapman Andrews quotations. And here's the first one. In the first 15 years of field work, I can remember just 10 times when I had really narrow escapes from death. Two were from drowning in typhoons. One was when our boat was charged by a wounded whale. Once my wife and I were nearly eaten by wild dogs. Once we were in great danger from fanatical llama priests. Two were close calls when I fell over cliffs. Once I was nearly caught by a huge python. And twice I might have been killed by bandits. Somebody needs to take this guy's life and his expeditions in the Gobi Desert and turn it into a movie. I would totally, it would be like Indiana Jones, but with dinosaurs. I, I, I'd see that. Uh, the second quotation, which I find very uh, amusing in light of that first quotation, is as follows. Adventures are the result of poor planning. <laughs> anyway, but back to the dinosaur. So this is the Tagosaurus. So the first time I saw a, a, a copy of uh, this diagram, I was quite surprised to see that on its neck and jaw, there are rows of little subconical bony studs there. Uh, or maybe they're carrots, I don't know, but that certainly would have uh, given a distinctive texture to its neck. Very surprising. Why was it very surprising? Well, it's because every picture I'd seen of Cetacosaurus up to that point showed them with a nice smooth neck. So uh, even though that uh, fossil was discovered in the 1920s, this uh, illustration by uh, Neve Parker done in the 1950s uh, does not show any bony neck armor. It's, uh, it's just smooth. So when I got the um, dinosaur hunter's uh, job, I decided, no, here's an opportunity to show people what the neck of a Cetacosaurus should look like. So here it is looking at you, just as in the, the original um, um, sketch of the fossil, and here with properly bony armor in place. So how about the uh, sauropod dinosaurs, the big long neck guys? Well, um, two important finds have uh, shed light on their skin texture. Luis Chiappi in Argentina has found uh, uh, sauropod skin impressions, and um, they show a covering of very small, round scales. I mean, only like five millimeters on the average in diameter. Next time you pick up a basketball, Get a good close look at the basketball, because by some coincidence, the texture of the basketball is virtually identical to the texture of sauropod skin. Very, very similar. Now, another um, uh, discovery made in 1990 uh, was a real surprise. It was a uh, Diplodocus that had skin impressions, including skin impressions over the back of the tail and another section from the midline of the tail, a long, thin whiplash that goes at the very end. And, um, unbeknownst to anybody until that time, the Diplodocus had a row of very tall, iguana-like spines running right down the middle, the midline of its back, and apparently going all the way to the tip of the tail. Um, we don't know for sure, but it's reasonable to assume that that row of spines went all the way up the neck to the back of the head as well. So, uh, Diplodocus was a much spinier looking dinosaur than anybody realized. Uh, it would not have looked like the Sinclair logo uh, <laughs> after all. Now, um, to be perfectly honest, this is actually supposed to be a Supersaurus. Supersaurus is just about exactly like Diplodocus, except that it's 40% bigger. So whenever I draw a Supersaurus, I just basically take a Diplodocus and then, well, supersize it, uh, spines and all. Now, uh, 
One more revelation that came of the dinosaur revolution was uh, the realization that uh, dinosaurs are more closely related to birds than they are to crocodiles, and in particular, the little two-legged meat-eating dinosaurs, the small theropods, uh, among their number were probably the ancestors of today's modern birds. Well, feathers are very complicated structures. They couldn't have just appeared overnight. And so uh, the idea began to be kicked around that perhaps some of the small two-legged meat-eating dinosaurs were feathered. Uh, Dr. Bacher portrayed a feathered dinosaur in a Scientific American magazine in 1975. By 1993, I'd uh, worked up the courage to depict a feathered dinosaur myself. So this is my uh, feathered mononychus from uh, uh, Dinosaur Hunters. All of this, although very, very reasonable speculation, remained speculation until 1996. And then uh, a new dinosaur was discovered in uh, the Yingxian Formation uh, in the province of Liaoning in northeastern China. And uh, that was named Sinosauropteryx. It was represented by beautifully complete, fully articulated skeletons. But all around the bones were um, filaments, long, thin, kind of hair-like structures. So this was not a scaly dinosaur in life. It was a fuzzy dinosaur. It would have had a texture very similar to that of a downy, uh, newly hatched chick. So they weren't um, identical to modern bird feathers, but they looked like the sort of structure that might have been ancestral to uh, modern feathers. And so uh, they have been referred to as proto-feathers. So, so Sinosauropteryx seems to have been a dinosaur with proto-feathers. Well, this uh, caused us to rethink the way that we restored certain small dinosaurs, Compsognathus, for example. And uh, further finds in Liaoning forced us to rethink other dinosaurs as well. For example, Oviraptor. Here's the Oviraptor I did in 93. This one's stealing an egg from a, a family of Protoceratops. That idea is wrong too, but that's another story for another day. And then uh, here we've got a whole bunch of Oviraptor heads, um, all covered with scales. But here is a, a, another Liaoning dinosaur called Caudipteryx. Now, Caudipteryx is a lot like an oviraptor. It's smaller. It's about the size of a turkey. And uh, in the impressions around the uh, skeleton are, is a fan of feathers at the tip of the tail and some more feathers coming off of the arms, making a pair of short wings. Uh, and, and not proto-feathers either. These are fully-fledged. <laughs> Here what I did there. Uh, feathers uh, that look almost identical to the feathers on a modern flightless bird. So uh, the next time I drew an oviraptor, and that's this guy right here, I, I put feathers on instead of scales, because that's the way to bet. Another dinosaur that had traditionally been portrayed with scales was Therizinosaurus. Uh, Therizinosaurus had a smaller relative called Bepiaosaurus, also found in uh, Liaoning, also um, from the Yingxian Formation. And uh, this one had uh, filaments all over it. And under the arm, the filaments were especially long and would have made sort of a shabby <clears throat> fringe uh, under its arms, a little bit like the arm of a orangutan. When I drew Segnosaurus, I um, didn't completely cover it with filaments because I figured it was so big. This is like about 1.8 tons in life, the size of a black rhino. So it might not have needed insulation over its whole body. But uh, I couldn't resist putting that fringe of uh, feathers, baby Alsaurus style, on uh, the undersides of its arms. And uh, that is Microraptor from the uh, uh, Jiufuteng Formation, uh, also in Liaoning. Liaoning is kind of like the hotbed of the world for feathered dinosaurs these days. Um, Microraptor was a lot like a Velociraptor, but uh, once again, really well-preserved specimens show long feathers coming off of not only its arms, but also its hind legs as well. So it was a four-winged dinosaur. Nobody's uh, really sure what its lifestyle was, but I kind of picture it gliding from one tree branch to another, kind of like a flying squirrel. And uh, then there's my old friend Cetacosaurus down at the bottom. By this time, I had something else to add to Cetacosaurus, a new detail. Uh, in probably from the Yingxian Formation, there's a specimen of a Cetacosaurus that has a, a brush-like structure 
of long quills or uh, thick stiff filaments all in a row right down the middle of the top of the base of the tail. So uh, that's something I added for uh, this trio or quartet of Cetacosaurus in that picture right there. And they just kept on coming. So now from Liaoning, we've got all kinds of feathered dinosaurs, and we've got all kinds of very primitive early dinosaur-like birds, and also some creatures that dwell in a kind of twilight zone where it's hard to tell whether they are bird-like dinosaurs or dinosaur-like birds. They're so nearly intermediate in their structure. One of the most abundant is Anchiornis. Hundreds of Anchiornis fossils have been found. Uh, it, at Liaoning, and we know quite a bit about it. Now, I kind of blame myself for what happened next. For years, indeed, for decades, I've been telling my students we will never know what color a dinosaur was in life. It's impossible to know that for sure. Well, the history of science should have taught me that it's risky to use the words impossible and never. Um, history has a way of biting you on the bum when you say that. For example, Auguste Comte confidently stated, we will never know what stars are made out of because it's impossible to sample them uh, directly. Well, in 1925, Cecilia Payne used the principle of spectroscopy to analyze the composition of the sun. And uh, then she did it with other stars. And nowadays, uh, we do know what stars are made out of. Thank you very much. So in my case, my Waterloo was a study done by uh, Jacob Vinther and his colleagues at Yale University. They had a good close look at a really well-preserved uh, uh, Anchiornis specimen and found that the uh, feathers were preserved in microscopic detail. And not only the feathers, but also melanosomes. Now these are little pigment packets that contain uh, pigments that give modern bird feathers many of their colors. And furthermore, they found that there is a correlation between the shape of the melanosome and the color of pigment that it contains. The sausage ones have black pigment, the egg-shaped ones have brown pigment, the circular ones have red pigment, or maybe I got that the wrong way around. But anyway, um, my point is that they were able to map out the distribution of the different shapes of melanosomes uh, on the Anchiornis specimen, and from that point on, it's just a case of color by numbers. So uh, this is uh, Anchiornis that I drew in 2011, and this is actually the color uh, of, the, uh, of the animal. It was covered all over with uh, gray uh, proto feathers, and then there were long true feathers on the arms and legs that were white with uh, bands and speckles of black, and then there was a crest of red on top of its head and a grayish red patch on each cheek. Now, mind you, they didn't actually look at every single square millimeter of that specimen, so this might not be 100% accurate, but what you're looking at here is consistent with the evidence uh, from, uh, from that Anchiornis study, and it's uh, better than uh, ignoring that evidence altogether. So yeah, we've uh, done that now for uh, several more dinosaurs. Is it like a dozen or half a dozen um, around there somewhere? And uh, so there are several dinosaurs now for which we know the uh, color of the critter in life. Now, one of my friends asked me, what's the biggest dinosaur that has feathers? And this is a difficult question to answer for two reasons. One, what are we calling a feather example uh, um, exactly? Do the uh, filaments, do those protofeathers count? And uh, the other reason this is a hard question to answer is um, how hard do you need the evidence to be? Do you need it to be something for which we've actually found the fossil feathers? Or can it be something that we think it was most likely feathered because its closest relatives were? So what I did here, I've got size basically on this axis with the small guys down here and the bigger guys up there. Well, duh, they're all showing me the same scale. And then on this axis, going from very simple proto feathers to uh, modern bird style feathers at this end over here. So uh, notably in this context is Eutyrannus, which is uh, a big, I mean look at this thing, it's rhinoceros sized. But a complete skeleton was found in China, and all around it, long filaments. So this was uh, shaggy. And um, first of all, 
that was really shocking to a lot of people. First of all, because it was big. It was much bigger than any um, feathered dinosaur or dinosaur with the uh, integumentary structures preserved that have been found so far. But also, this is a member of the Tyrannosaur group. This is very, very close to the ancestry of Tyrannosaurus rex. So, did Tyrannosaurus rex actually sport a coat of proto-feathers? Well, we don't know. The biggest Tyrannosaurus rex skin impressions that have ever been found are about the size of a postage stamp. So most of the animal's skin texture is a mystery. Uh, some artists have started restoring their Tyrannosaurus rexes shaggy and feathery rather than uh, scaly. Others figure that this guy, Eutyrannus, was living in a cool uh, uplands environment where there may have even been a bit of snow in the wintertime and would have needed that um, coat for insulation. Whereas, meanwhile, the gigantic, much bigger, six and a half ton Tyrannosaurus rex living here in Wyoming, which looked a whole lot like subtropical Louisiana at the time, wouldn't have needed any sort of insulation and could have been bare skinned like an elephant or a rhinoceros instead. Jury's still out on that one. Uh, down here is Utah Raptor, and nobody has found structures. Um, associated with the bones of Utah Raptor that uh, show us what the skin texture was like. But Utah Raptor is basically uh, a larger relative of Micro Raptor, except that instead of being cat-sized, it's grizzly bear-sized. And uh, Micro Raptor's feathers are virtually identical to modern bird feathers. So if Utah Raptor had feathers, they were uh, modern, fully, uh, fully modern feathers, just like we see in the birds of today. Uh, just like my subhyracodon picture, uh, this picture I had colorized by somebody other than myself, namely Shaden Kennedy sitting right there in the middle of the room. <laughs> and uh, so that's what these guys uh, might have looked like um, in, uh, in full color. Incidentally, although we can detect um, uh, red and brown and black and white and several other colors by looking at melanosomes, um, there are other colors that can't be detected that way. Uh, blue, for example, and green, those colors are produced by the microstructure of the feathers rather than by pigments. So it's impossible to, oh wait a minute, we don't yet know how to detect <laughs> green and blue in, uh, in uh, fossil uh, dinosaurs and, uh, and ancient birds, but stay tuned, who knows what else might happen. And uh, that is about all I have to say about that, unless uh, anybody has any questions. Thank you all very much for your time, and uh, thank you, uh, the lead, for uh, um, having me uh, talk here, and for the Tate Museum for my continued care and feeding. <laughs> thank you. So tell us, Russell, how did you get in interested in paleo art? Well, um, I got interested in dinosaurs when I was about four um, because uh, I, I got some dinosaurs in my stocking and then started seeing pictures like the, the first one I showed you, the Salinger picture, and I don't know what it was about them. I was just hooked. They just looked so weird and so outlandish. There was something fascinating about them. And I also really liked drawing when I was a kid, and so uh, naturally one of the first ways to express my interest in dinosaurs was to start drawing pictures of them. Um, the, the first ones, though, were not very good. I, I, I didn't get uh, better at, at drawing dinosaurs until about like high school, uh, give or take. Yeah. Could it be possible that these colors that we're assuming it's the colors of the dinosaur could be more as a camouflage that maybe that time period the plants and vegetation rather were these kind of colors, kind of like modern day animals now, how the colorization matches their surroundings? That is a very good possibility, and um, actually when I was talking about the, uh, the different ways that an artist can uh, look for inspiration or help make the decision about what color to make your dinosaur, I totally left out camouflage. And I shouldn't have, because that's an important one, yeah. A lot of animals today, their color patterns are dictated by um, their, their environment and, uh, and the need for camouflage. So. Um, for example, uh, green is a very good color for blending in with uh, 
leaves and uh, uh, other kinds of vegetation. So although the uh, green dinosaur has kind of gone out of style in uh, modern artwork, uh, it shouldn't be uh, thrown, uh, it shouldn't be rejected out of hand. It's still a real possibility. Yes, Shane? I can tell you for certain that one of the colors on there was not based on any living thing. The concavenator I based on the Spanish flag. <laughs> Because it's one of the most famous dinosaurs from Spain. And you're allowed to do that. You're allowed to do and that. You never just, know, you know, just make the Hawaii with the lava and the volcano. Mm. It, it goes even farther. Um, the black pigment in modern bird feathers, uh, the, the part of the feather that's black is actually stronger and stiffer than the part that's white. That pigment actually has a, a structural reinforcing quality. So, you know, I've looked at magpies all my life and thought that the, the black tips to the wing feathers that gave it that kind of black fringe just looked cool. But no, that actually helps. It has a structural, functional role. Uh, and it can't be, um, the idea cannot be rejected that uh, some dinosaur colors might have uh, had nothing to do with how the animal looked, but that uh, might have been for other reasons as well. A flamingo. Why is it pink? Is that camouflage? Abbott Thayer thought so. He thought that he could stand up against a sunset and blend in with the sunset. And the crocodiles couldn't see them. He was dead wrong, of course. It turns out that a flamingo is pink because it eats little tiny shrimps, and the little tiny shrimps eat dinoflagellates, which contain red pigments. And then wow. that uh, makes the flamingo pink. But uh, yeah, there's no adaptive significance. It's just you are what you eat. Here. Incidentally, there is a pterodactyl that seems to have strained little tiny shrimps out of the water. Um, and they probably ate dinoflagellates. They probably had red pigment. That pterodactyl very well could have been pink. I've seen very few people have the uh, courage to portray a pink pterodactyl, but it's another possibility that we have to keep our minds open to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how much do we know about the vision of dinosaurs and their prey type thing? That's a good question, yeah. Um, very little. Uh, the, the eyeballs don't preserve. You might have noticed on the Sinosauropteryx that there's kind of a, a roundish, darkish blob in its eye socket. That's some of the organic material left over from the eyeball. But the structure itself is lost, so we don't know a whole lot about that. Now, what we do know is this. Um, dinosaurs generally have pretty big eyes. Uh, my old friends, the ankylosaurs, are the exception. They have tiny, beady little eyes. But if you look at the Trinosaurus rex skull in the museum, uh, its eye sockets are big enough to fit an orange in there. So big eyes. Um, the ostrich dinosaurs, Trigomimus, we've got one of those too, uh, they've got enormous eyes for their body size. And so this indicates that uh, vision was important to them and uh, that they probably saw very well. Now something else to keep in mind is that um, Color vision and night vision are more or less at odds with each other. If you want to pack in more rods, you got to get rid of a few cones and versa visa. And uh, animals that see in the dark, uh, cats and dogs, for example, uh, generally have very poor color vision, or in some cases, even no color vision at all. And uh, then other animals that uh, move about by day um, have, uh, have good color vision. So dinosaurs, as near as we know, based on the fact that they're uh, descended from reptiles, which are mostly diurnal, and that they are the ancestors of birds, which are also mostly diurnal, and uh, birds and reptiles mostly have very good color vision, it seems very likely to assume that dinosaurs have good color vision. And if they had good color vision, then that raises the possibility that they were seeing and using color for display and communication amongst yourselves. It's another reason that artists these days are not as afraid to put bright, brilliant colors on their dinosaurs. Yeah? You mentioned that uh, animals that see in the dark probably have less color vision. Do you think that that means something like Optomosaurus or Raptaranon would have had low color vision? That's a real possibility. Yeah. And so therefore, they might not have used color skin displays um, for signaling within their own species. So yeah, if you want to paint a uh, Tanodon gunmetal gray from front to back, like Zalinger would have, then knock yourself out. Yeah. Color could have also been to do with mating, though, too. Look at the peacock. Right, right. 
And this brings up a point about Anchiornis, and that is that uh, a second Anchiornis was analyzed the same way that that first one was, and they didn't find any red pigment at all. Uh, and so that raises the possibility that uh, maybe one was a male and one was a female, and the male was um, more, more colorful. We do know that, the, oh, wait, no, Confucius Aurus is, is a bird, so it doesn't count, never mind. Um, so we, we do know that there was a, a possibility of sexual dimorphism there, or maybe they started out with somber colors, and then only upon reaching sexual maturity, would they have developed the, uh, the bright red crest and the cheek patches? Or maybe they only had those bright colors during the breeding season and the rest of the uh, year they were, yeah, there's all sorts of possibilities there. Um, and we can again look to analogs in our modern world for uh, ideas as to why these things are. Yeah? The, the main reason I was asking is I was watching a program a while ago about tigers in India. And, and their prey on chattel deer. And they've done studies now to show that orange of a tiger to a chattel deer appears green against the vegetation. Yeah. So they're virtually invisible unless they move. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, that's uh, something else to keep in mind that the way that we see an animal's color might not be the way that it's seen by its competitors or by its prey. And so yeah, that's something else to keep in mind. And actually, that's kind of a blessing with dinosaurs, because if they did see in color as we do, then um, it's uh, more likely that we could predict what sorts of colors they'd be likely to have. Alrighty. <coughs> well, cool. Thank you all very much. I uh, brought an enormous number of models up here. 